Today is Tuesday, October 23rd, 2012. I am Richard Vonnegut with the Hoosier Rails to Trails Council, and I'm with Al Hammersley of Butler, Fairman, Seifert, and we're going to talk about how Al Hammersley and Butler, Fairman, Seifert's been involved with trail development in Indiana over the past 20 years. 21, almost 21 years ago, President, then President Bush, in his waning days in December of 1991, signed the iced tea that we've come to know and love. Where were you then, and what's happened since? Uh, at that point, I was with a, uh, an engineering firm uh, known as Wetzel Engineers, and I was designing bridges and, and working on site development projects. Didn't know uh, anything really about iced tea or what the TE of iced tea meant. Nelson Steele was a vice president. Correct. And he heard about the Mona. He heard about something called the Mona. That, uh, the city of Indianapolis wanted to do something with the abandoned rail corridor. And uh, Nelson, uh, very, very much involved, a, a passion for him, running, bicycling, that sort of thing. He, uh, he convinced firm, that it was something we needed to chase. It was a public works project that uh, unique that needed to, needed to be done and we needed to be part of it. Sadly, he died. Do you remember when? Uh, it was, was? Uh, early summer of 2003. <laughs> So he heard about the Monon, yes. and this project developed, and Butler, Firm, and Seifert was the lead. That's correct. What, what did it take to be the lead, and what did Nelson do to pull this together? Well, he, uh, we pulled together some partners we'd worked with before uh, on, on other projects, put together uh, the best team we, we could to chase that project. It was a project like most public works projects that were out for qualifications. We submitted our qualifications with all the other teams and, and we were selected. Uh, Nelson worked hard to uh, to do whatever we could to get that project. Again, it was a near and dear to his heart and, and a passion he had to, to work on that. Uh, what became uh, a, a landmark trail project in the state of Indiana. Now, I'm going to hit the big picture and then back up. Okay. What were some of the things that made it a landmark trail? Well, it was the first of its type uh, using the ICE-T or the Transportation Enhancement Funding of the magnitude, the, the size of the project, the scope, uh, including the length and also the costs involved, urban setting, transitioning from urban to suburban setting, that sort of thing. And it really was the first of its kind in the state of Indiana using those kinds of funds. It was, it was a kind of a groundbreaking project. Now we need to say, we've talked about ICE-T, that really is the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act of 1991. Right. And as would be typical of transport Congress and transportation policies, it would have been six years, the policies and funding running for six years and to be renewed in 1997. But this had a quirk in that it included bicycle, walking and some funding for trails and not only trails but the enhancements had 12 pockets of vegetation for runoff oil runoff and for archaeology for a variety of trails and, and enhancing transportation Correct. facilities Correct. the monon being an example of that Correct. how did you get involved what nelson called you or well, um, we were, um, I was involved personally on designing bridges and some site development, uh, commercial development, that sort of thing. 
And there were several bridges on the first phase of the Mona. And they uh, needed a project manager, a project engineer to, to shepherd that project through the process and asked me. And I said, sure, why not? And uh, it kind of snowballed from there. We uh, worked with our partners on, on developing a master plan for the Monon here in Indianapolis in Marion County. And uh, then uh, they received federal funding and proceeded with the next, the first several phases of actual construction of the trail. And, and we, were, we were the lead on the development of those, those construction documents and getting that project, those projects built. Now, your work from graduating at Purdue mm -hmm. um, up to the moment had been, so for more than a decade, had been mostly involved with bridges. So it's nothing surprising that you would have been looking at the Monon Fall Creek Bridge, the Monon White River Bridge, right. and the Monon sort of short White River, the spillway, right. as it were, overflow right. bridge. How do the bridges differ? You're, you're walking right. through, you're looking at railroad bridges, and you're saying, had me saying to yourself, this is different. They, they very different. <laughs> uh, the bridges were existing, as opposed to most of our projects were involved in replacing a, a highway bridge that you know, had either was, was old or was deficient in some way and putting in a new highway bridge. This was a matter of reusing uh, an existing bridge that originally had been designed to uh, carry locomotives, obviously, and now needed to be redesigned, reconfigured to carry uh, pedestrians and bicyclists. So as far as the loading goes, it was, it was pretty much uh, an easy thing to figure out the loading was going to be. From a few hundred tons to, right, to right. a few hundred pounds. Right. Uh, <laughs> but converting those simple structures that weren't meant to have pedestrians and bicycle on us to one that was, which including uh, pavement where there were tracks and, and ties and ballast before, now we had pavement, we had railings, uh, we had to make sure the width was wide enough and, and that sort of thing and the approaches to some of those bridges. Uh, we had to take all those things into account and at that point we were working with the city and, uh, and NDOT, the Federal Highways uh, representative here in the state of Indiana, working with them to figure out those standards. How, what were they supposed to look like? What were their requirements for safety and accessibility? You made the master plan for the Monon, and then from there, 
began implementation, the various phases of implementation. What was the first phase and how difficult was it once the master plan was made to to start designing the details for the bridges and for the surface and for hydrology, water passage and such? Um, the first section, if I remember correctly, was from Broad Ripple North to 86th Street. Uh, again, this, the bridge structures were there. It's a matter of adapting them to, to reuse. The uh, ballast where the train used to run was there. The, the ties and the, uh, and the rails were gone. The, uh, in some areas, the, uh, the ballast was rather narrow on top. The, uh, we were looking for at least a 10-foot wide trail. And in some areas, that's what we use. With all the traffic on the Monon, we could certainly, you know, in some places use 20 feet wide with all the people that, that use the trail every day. Well, now you know that, but you weren't sure of that in, 2000, in 1993. In 1993, we didn't know how many people or if anybody was going to use the trail. We were pretty convinced they would, but didn't have any idea what that number would be. And, uh, and in, in subsequent sections uh, to the south, and I believe also to the north, uh, they we and others have designed those trails to be wider uh, where possible, as wide as possible, just because of the volume of the traffic on it. The Broad Ripple the bridge over the canal is heavy decked. Um, heavy structure, simply a matter of putting a deck down and putting railings up inside the original structure to make it safe. As you mentioned, uh, the overflow, we, we did take down a couple of piers, had to reconstruct the ones that were left to make sure the grades all matched, as you referenced. And some of the steel was new, uh, brand new deck on top of that. So each each one of those bridges was were addressed in a different manner, and uh, to make it to make it fit the situation. And those places where we adjusted the grade on the uh, trail, we would have to bring that buck up, like you said, to to match. And that's where sometimes we'd have to put in retaining walls and railing and that sort of thing to to get the grades to match each other. But one of the beauties of rail trail is you basically have a massively compact, 100-year-old compact surface. Right. So that, that's pretty stable. Right. Not, not too much concern about, what, uh, about the pavement being stable as long as you can get it <laughs> paved, right? Once, once you got the Monon, mm -hmm. phase one down, what were some of the specific things you learned that you carried to the next phases or you carried to other projects? Well, it was... Uh, as opposed to looking at roads and bridges where we're looking at a, a vehicle driving 60, 70 miles an hour, learned, uh, I personally learned that those concrete joints, the, the details involved in building some of this infrastructure needed to have much more detail put to it, to the, to the specifications and to the plans and during construction. Pay attention to those details because those joints are going to be seen by people. They're going to be stopping and standing in, at overlook areas and things like that. So the, the, um, the finish of some of those things were much more important than they would be on, say, a bridge or a highway where people are rarely ever see it in a, in a stopping and standing type situation. So uh, a lot of detailing is one thing that, that I think I personally picked up, that those details mattered an awful lot when you're at a pedestrian and bicycle level. Well, and you mentioned the overlooks, mm -hmm. but there's there's two things there. The overlook surface, as I recall on the Monon White River Bridge, is a is a, an expandable see-through grating mm -hmm. or a screen type, right. which is a lot different surface than the concrete or the asphalt. Right. I think the uh, decision to do that on the overlooks was uh, more uh, a case of experience that as you walk out over it to, to give you that sense of where you are that you're you're hanging off the side of the bridge more or less and let you be able to see the water down below and and, uh, and uh, be a little just a little bit different experience from being on the on the trail itself it also helped to delineate that when you're on the concrete you're on the trail you're you're in traffic if you if you would uh, if you're on the overlook, you, you should be feel safe that you're out of traffic, that uh, people aren't going to be coming past you and expecting to be able to pass you, that sort of thing, that you're, you're off and, and enjoying the view uh, and uh, 
experiencing that uh, that open water below you. <laughs> Alan, yes. as a civil engineer, when you were in school, what did you think you were going to get involved in, and what did you get involved in, and explain civil engineering. Uh, generally deals with the built environment, uh, roads, bridges, uh, sanitary sewer, wastewater treatment, uh, water supply, airports, site development and site design, grading and, and stormwater, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and trails, greenways, and, and parks. Um, what I studied at school, I major, majored in structures. That's how I got to be in bridge design at one point. Um, thought that's what I wanted to do, and I, and I did, and uh, enjoyed it. Um, certainly, when I graduated in 1980, I had no idea that 13, 14, 15 years later, I'd start heading down a different path, but that's probably true for an awful lot of people, but uh, um, it it's still related back to building things for the public. The civil engineer is, is building things for the, the public to use. How does civil engineering compare and fit with um, landscape architects and, and other profession plans? Well, I, I think if, if done correctly and with, and with the right approach, they, they fit in and mesh very well. Um, Landscape architects deal with the, the land, the, the landscape, the environment you see and experience. And um, certainly the civil engineering aspects, the roads, the bridges, the buildings, and, and, and utilities need to fit within that environment. And uh, I've very much enjoyed working side by side with landscape architects on this and making it look like it belonged there and maybe it's always been there, and uh, that it fits right in, uh, as opposed to a, a stark black ribbon of asphalt that, that you know was plopped down in the middle of nowhere. That sort of thing. It, it, my goal would be to make it look like it, it belongs there and it fits in that landscape. Al, thank you very much yeah. for for your time and for talking about Butler Firm and Seifert and all the endeavors of building trails. My pleasure. And thank you for designing and building the trails, well, too, over the past my, 20 years. That's my pleasure as well. <laughs> okay. Well, I've enjoyed it. Been having fun. I propose to keep doing that, too. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.